Chapter 3. Fat Man Out Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was a hefty plumber's helper discovered by Max Sennett in 1913 when he came to unclog the comedy producer's drain. Sennett sized up the affable 266-pound Roscoe and offered him a job on the spot. Arbuckle's butterball appearance and bouncing agility were perfect foils for Sennett's brand of film farce. Mud and mayhem, pratfalls and custard pies. Working his way up from the Keystone Cops, Fatty went on to team with Mabel Norman in Fatty's Flirtations, Charlie Chaplin in The Rounders, Buster Keaton in The Butcher Boy, and other popular two real comedies. Fatty's natural talent as a jovial Jack and Apes assured his success as a screen buffoon and made his fortune. Fatty's value as a laugh maker rocketed his Senate three dollar a day salary of nineteen thirteen to five thousand dollars a week in nineteen seventeen when he signed with Paramount. A gag banner over the famous gate proclaimed, Paramount welcomes the Prince of Wales. The boozy all-night revel held on March 6th at Michon Manor, Boston, to celebrate that signing almost became a public scandal. It took place at Brownie Kennedy's Roadhouse, where the lavish entertainment laid on in Fatty's honor included 12 party girls who were paid $1,050 for their contribution to the evening's fun. A blue-nosed busybody peeked through an open transom just as Fatty and the girls were stripping on the table, decided decency had been outraged, and called the cops. Attending the festivities were movie magnates Adolf Zucker, Jesse Lasky, and Joseph Schenk. They ended up paying $100,000 in hush money to the Boston District Attorney and Mayor James Curley to bury the incident. It was at another of Fatty's frolics, four years later, that an obscure starlet achieved instant renown. Unfortunately, the young lady was in no position to profit from her fame. Virginia Rapp, a lovely brunette model from Chicago, had attracted some attention when her smiling face appeared under a sunbonnet on the sheet music cover of Let Me Call You Sweetheart. An offer came from Senate, and she went to work on his lot, taking minor parts. She also did her share of sleeping around and gave, help and gave half the company crabs. This epidemic so shocked Senate that he closed down his studio and had it fumigated. Virginia was forgiven, however, and soon started going steady with veteran Senate director Henry Pathé Lehrman. He gave her a small part in his film Fantasy and later introduced her to Arbuckle when he directed him in Josie Loses a Sweetheart. Virginia's raven-haired beauty was noticed by William Fox when she won a Best Dressed Girl in Pictures award. He took her under contract. There was talk of starring Virginia in a Fox feature, Twilight Baby. Virginia Rapp seemed to be on her way. Arbuckle had his roving eye on Virginia for some time. He had asked her to be a leading lady in one of his comedies and had insisted that his friend, Bambina Maud Delmont, bring her to a party celebrating his new year, his new three-year, three million dollar contract with Paramount. Fatty loved liquor and ladies. The more, the merrier. On a whim, Fatty chose San Francisco as the scene of his revel. It would give him the chance to try out his new $25,000 custom-made Pierce Arrow. On Labor Day weekend, two carloads of holidaying film folk roared off in great hilarity on a five or four hundred and fifty mile dash up the coast highway of the city hills, or the city of hills. Fatty and his movie colony cronies, Lowell Sherman and Freddie Fishback, were piled in his flashy Pierce era with Virginia Rapp, Bambina Maud Delmont, and assorted showgirls in another. Arriving in the Bay City late Saturday night, Arbuckle checked in at the luxurious Hotel St. Francis, sending the girls on to the palace. Fatty took three adjoining suites on the 12th floor, enough room for any developments. Fatty rang up his bootleg connection, Tom Tom the Bellboy, found some jazz on the radio, and the party was on. On Labor Day afternoon, Monday, September 5th, 1921, the party was still going strong. It was Fatty's open house with people coming and going, the crowd swollen to about 50, and the host a happy drunk. Virginia and the other girls were downing gin-laced orange blossoms. Some shed their tops to do the shimmy. Guests were trading pajama bottoms, and the empty bottles were piling up. At about a quarter after three, Arbuckle, flapping around in pajamas and a bathrobe, grabbed Virginia and steered the tipsy model to the bedroom of Suite 1221. He gave the revelers his famous leering wink, saying, This is the chance I've waited for for a long time, and locked the door. Bambina Maud Delmont later testified that the festivities were stilled when the sharp screams rang out in the adjoining bedroom. Weird moans were heard through the door. After much pounding and kicking, a giggling arbuckle sallied forth in ripped pajamas. Virginia's hat squashed on his head at a crazy angle and quipped to the girls, go in and get her dress and take her to the palace. She makes too much noise. 
When Virginia kept screaming, he yelled, shut up or I'll throw you out of the window. Bambina and a showgirl friend, Alice Blake, found Virginia nearly nude on the disor disordered bed, writhing in pain and moaning, I'm dying, I'm dying, he hurt me. As Alice later testified, we tried to dress her, but found her clothing torn to shreds. Her shirt waist, underclothes, and even her stockings were ripped and torn so that no one could hardly recognize what garments they were. Virginia was only able to whisper to a nurse in the exclusive Pine Street Hospital where she was taken, Fatty Arbuckle did this to me. Please see that he doesn't get away with it before sinking into a coma. On September 10th, one year to the day after the death of Olive Thomas, Virginia Rapp died, age 25, losing forever her chance to star in Twilight Baby. The cause of her death almost went undiscovered. The San Francisco deputy coroner, Michael Brown, suspicious after a fishy phone call from the hospital inquiring about a post-mortem, went around personally to see what was going on. What was going on was the beginning of a frantic cover-up. He was just in time to see an orderly emerge from an elevator and head for the hospital's incinerator with a glass jar containing Virginia's injured female organs. He requisitioned the organs from the reluctant doctor so that he could conduct his own examination. Thus, it was revealed that Virginia's bladder had been ruptured by some form of violence, which led to her death from peritonitis. Brown reported the matter to his superior, Coroner T.B. Lalande, and it was agreed that a, a police investigation was in order. Detectives Tom Reagan and Griffith Kennedy were soon grilling the uneasy hospital staff to find out who was covering up what they found out. So did the newspapers. When Fatty Arbuckle was charged with Virginia Rapp's rape and murder, all the world knew the name of Virginia Rapp. The state of California blamed her death on external pressure applied by Arbuckle during sexual dalliance. A forlorn fame for Virginia. A heavy rap for Fatty. Murder one. The shock waves coming from San Francisco that September nearly shook Hollywood to its newly laid foundations. It was all too unbelievable. Fatty, Kitty's favorites, ride a laughs, balloon attic, champion of good clean slapstick fun suddenly featured in movie star death orgy. Headlines. Arbuckle orgy, raper, dances while victim dies. As headlines screamed, the rumors flew of a hideously unnatural rape. Arbuckle, enraged at his drunken impotence, had ravaged Virginia with a Coca-Cola bottle or a champagne bottle. Then it repeated the act with a jagged piece of ice. Or wasn't it common knowledge that Arbuckle was exceptionally well endowed? Or was it just a question of 266 pounds too much of fatty flattening Virginia in a flying leap? Well, what was certain was a leap in circulation. The tabloids had a field day printing insinuations about Arbuckle's bottle party. The San Francisco Examiner editorialized, quote, Hollywood must stop using San Francisco for a garbage can, end quote. The coroner was quoted as demanding steps to prevent a further occurrence of such events so that San Francisco will not be made the rendezvous of the debauched and the gangster. San Francisco churches demanded retribution for the sex-mad maniac from Hollywood who chose law-abiding San Francisco for his shameful revels. In Hartford, Connecticut, women vigilantes ripped down the screen in a theater showing an Arbuckle comedy, while in Thermopolis, Wyoming, cowhands shot up the screen of a movie house showing an Arbuckle short. Barrages of bottles and eggs were reported. As a lynch fatty movie, or, or as a lynch fatty mood swept the land, vigilante groups demanded a cleanup of the whole Hollywood colony. Arbuckle's films were withdrawn. While Arbuckle sweated it out in a San Francisco jail, being held in custody in the grim old Kearney Street Hall of Justice, his lawyers fought to have his first-degree murder charge changed to manslaughter. Adolph Zucker, who had millions at stake on Arbuckle, phoned San Francisco District Attorney Matt Brady in an effort to quash the case. It merely outraged Brady, who later charged he had been offered a bribe. Other prominent movie colony figures called Brady to suggest that Arbuckle shouldn't be crucified just because Virginia Rapp drank too much and died. The DA was enraged at these further interventions. The trial began in mid-November 1921 in San Francisco's Superior Court, with Arbuckle taking the stand to deny any wrongdoing. His attitude seemed to be one of complete indifference to Virginia Rapp. At no point did he express remorse or even sorrow for her death. His lawyers were even more out front. A concerted attempt was made to besmirch Virginia's character, suggesting she was, quote, loose, end quote, and had slept around in New York, South America, and Paris, as well as Hollywood. After much conflicting testimony, the jury favored acquitting Arbuckle by 10 to 2 after 43 hours deliberation. A mistrial was declared. A second trial went 10 to 2 for conviction and was dismissed. Fatty, who was out on bail, was forced to sell his sedate English home on West Adams Street in L.A. and his fleet of fancy cars to pay lawyers' fees. 
Despite the indignant Brady who wanted to nail Fatty in the worst way, Arbuckle was acquitted in a third trial ending April 12, 1922, largely due to incredible confused testimony by 40 witnesses, mostly drunk at the time of the incident, and the lack of specific evidence, such as a bloody bottle. The jury that freed Fatty made this comment, Acquittal is not enough for Roscoe Arbuckle. We feel a grave injustice has been done to him, and there was not the slightest proof to connect him in any way with the commission of any crime. On the courtroom steps, Arbuckle told the press, This is the most solemn moment of my life. My innocence of the hideous charge preferred against me, or preferred against me has been proved. I am truly grateful to my fellow men and women. My life has been devoted to the production of clean pictures for the happiness of children. I shall try to enlarge my field of usefulness so that my art shall have a wider service. His solemn moment of hope was short-lived, however. Fatty was free, but not forgiven. Henry Lerman, Virginia's erstwhile boyfriend, had this bitter comment. Virginia had the most remarkable determination. She would rise from the dead to defend her person from indignity. As for Arbuckle, this is what comes of taking vulgarians from the butt gutter and giving them enormous salaries and making idols of them. Some people don't know how to get a kick out of life, except in a beastly way. They are the ones who participate in orgies that surpass the orgies of degenerate Rome. Or, he might have added... Babylon. Madam Eleanor Glynn, the movie colony's tone setter, took the occasion to comment on Hollywood's rotten apples. If they are fragrantly immoral, hang them. Do not show the pictures, suppress them, but do not make them all suffer for a few. This Arbuckle party was a beastly, disgusting thing, and things like it should be stamped out. But I didn't see any such things in Hollywood, and if there are dope parties there, they must be very small. Paramount canceled Arbuckle's $3 million contract. His unreleased films were junked, causing the studio a cool million dollar write off. Fatty the Funny Man was finished. The Prince of Wales had been harpooned. Arbuckle was banned from acting. Only a few friends like Buster Keaton remained faithful. It was Keaton who suggested Arbuckle should change his name to Will Be Good. He did adopt the name of William Goodrich in later years and gained employment as a gag man and comedy director. But Arbuckle wanted to act. He pleaded in the March 1931 photo play, just let me work. I want to go back to the screen. I think I can entertain and gladden the people that see me. All I want is that. If I do get back, it will be grand. If I don't, well, okay. Well, okay was the way it worked out. Fatty was never allowed to forget his fame, his, his fall from grace. People whistled, I'm coming Virginia, when they recognized him in the street. That sticky ink wouldn't wash off. The party he was forced to play was Pagliacci. In his forced retirement, Arbuckle took to drinking heavily. Bottles seemed to haunt him. In 1931, Fatty was arrested in Hollywood for a drunk driving charge. As the traffic cop approached, Fatty flung a bottle from the car laughing, there goes the evidence. Was he thinking of another bottle that went sailing out of the 12th floor window of the Hotel St. Francis on Labor Day 1921? Broke and broken, he died at 46 in New York, June 28, 1933. Poor Fatty. La Faire Arbuckle scared Hollywood out of 10 years growth. Hollywood now meant more than dreamland. It was forever linked with scandal in the minds of millions.